If you don't believe drugs have done good things for us, do me a favor then. Go home tonight, take all your albums, your tapes, and your CDs, and burn them. I guess it's time. I've tackled Lateralis, what I consider the greatest album ever recorded. I've tackled 10,000 Days, one of the most emotionally draining albums I've ever heard. Now, it's time to tackle Tool's second studio album and another one of the greatest metal records of all time, Anima. Today, I'm going to attempt to dissect the lyricism packed into this album and hopefully convey the message this album delivers in a more palatable way for you. That's enough dilly-dallying. Let's get started. Before we begin with the first track, let's talk about the title of the album. Anima itself is not a word, but the combination of two words. Two words that I feel flawlessly prepare the listener for what's to come on this record. Anima is Latin for the soul and is often associated with the concept of life force. Anima, on the other hand, is a medical procedure involving the injection of fluids into the rectum. On one hand, this album will tackle the essence of your very being, will transcribe feelings that you thought never could be put into words, and on the other hand, will make funny sex jokes. There really isn't anything like this album out there. With the title out of the way, let's dive right into the first track. Track 1, Stink Fist. My 10,000 Days video, I said Vicarious was my favorite album opener on any Tool record, but that wasn't correct. Sorry. Stink Fist is a song so vulgar that my mom refuses to listen to it, and yet I find it to be one of the most poetically beautiful songs on this record. It's a song that is truly aged like fine wine. The song begins with the narrator reflecting on his current situation. He finds himself overwhelmed and overstimulated to the point of numbness, but he kind of basks in this fact. It's the very overstimulation that he finds a sense of safety in, and yet he knows he has to change. He crashes again, and yet it's, it's not enough. The narrator is resolved to reach an unreachable finish line. As the song progresses, the narrator describes his depth within a borderline. On a surface level, yeah, he's talking about some nasty shit, but I kind of liken it to how deep he dives into this dopamine cycle. The second verse begins, and the narrator again resolves to change. But it's not enough. He needs more. Now, knuckle deep within this borderline, he reflects again. If you've ever found yourself overstimulated with social media or dopamine or whatever it is, you, you know where he's at. How can this mean anything to me if I really don't feel anything at all? Absolutely mesmerizing line, followed up by the narrator's new resolve. He will continue forward until he feels something as he chases this infinitely far finish line. The song concludes with the narrator fully submerging himself in this misery, in this never-ending chase. There's no turning back now. Incredible opener. Track 2, Eulogy. Eulogy is a tricky track for me to explain to you as it focuses on an unnamed martyr who the band has never confirmed the identity of. Jesus is a popular answer, L. Ron Hubbard is another one, and Kurt Cobain is the silliest one I've heard, but none of these have all that much merit, to be honest. L. Ron Hubbard is the most plausible answer, but again, nothing's been confirmed. I think this song is about nobody specifically, but simply about martyrs as a whole. Perhaps about religious figures as a whole. This song is simply a teardown of the egocentric religious martyrs that want to feel important. I find the message of this song to be just, don't trust everybody you meet. Very few people in this world really have your best interest in mind, and even fewer will act on those feelings. A lot of these people just want to take money and will do whatever it takes to do so. Not the deepest track, but a good one. Track 3, H. H is a track centered around Maynard's experience as a new parent. I'm surprised this hasn't come up yet, but if you're unfamiliar, Maynard is the vocalist and lyricist for Tool. Anyway, this track centers around his fears of his child ending up like himself. Maynard was questioned about the song's meaning and had this to say. So, any of you ever watch those Warner Brothers cartoons? Sometimes there's that one where the guy is having a tough time trying to make a decision. He's got an angel on one soldier, the devil on the other. Seems pretty obvious, right? Usually the angel's the one that's kind of gives the good advice. The devil is trying to get him to do what's going to be bad for him. It's not always that simple, though. Most times they're not really angels or devils, but they're just friends giving you advice looking out for your best interest, but not really understanding what's going to be best for you. 
So it kind of comes down to you. You have to make the decision for yourself. He then said his son's name is Devo H, confirming the suspicions around the subject of the song. It's a song about learning to become a parent, an experience I can't personally connect with, but when I can definitely empathize with. It's a tremendous amount of pressure to raise a kid, and even more pressure to not change who they are in the process. The song itself begins with the very birth of his son. As he looks at his son, he sees his own reflection, and within that reflection, he can see a snake. A snake is often used as a biblical and mythological symbol for a liar. Anyway, he realizes that he must confront this snake and this darkness within him in order to grow and become a man worthy of raising a child. He was able to suppress this snake within himself for his entire life, but with the birth of his son, all of these traumas and terrible feelings of the past have come back in full force as he's now afraid to, to push them upon his child. Then the chorus begins as he reflects upon the very nature of his relationship with his son. His son is what keeps him from slipping back into that darkness within himself. But he describes this in a, a strange way. He calls it fading away, which in my mind feels a little resentful in a way. Not towards his son, but towards the very fact that he is changing as a person into someone he can't really recognize, considerately killing him. The song enters the final verse as his entire world comes crashing down. He sheds his skin and the walls around his heart crumble. The snake was dead, and as he looked into the snake's eyes, he was no longer afraid. He reflects on his past and wishes he would have just cried. He wishes he would have just let himself feel. He looks back into his son's eyes and remembers the many times he's died. Not literally, of course, but the death of his younger selves, his past selves, allowing him to become a better person. He no longer fears death, and he no longer fears the future. I don't mind, he repeats. The song concludes with the repetition of the phrase, considerately killing me, as though he acknowledges his newfound change and can now accept it. Mind-boggling track. Track four, Useful Idiot. Our first interlude track of the album here, but most certainly not the last. The noise heard within this track is the sound of a vinyl record concluding, intended to fool listeners into thinking that the record was over. This song makes absolutely zero sense on streaming services, but it's a funny little track. Nothing more here though. Track 5, 46 and 2. 46 and 2 is what I would describe as the Tool song. Short and sweet by Tool's standards, but still equally powerful. The title of the song is in reference to the number of chromosomes people have. 23 pairs of somatic chromosomes and two sex chromosomes. The song tackles the ideas of change, growth, and most notably survival, which many speculate to be a reference to cellular division, which is how humans evolve and grow. The song begins with an incredibly quiet verse that's fairly hard to make out. Join in and listen, he says, digging through my numbled shadow. The shadow mentioned here and throughout the rest of this track is used as a symbol of our subconscious mind. More specifically, the term shadow is used in Jungian psychology and refers to the unconscious aspect of the personality, which the conscious ego does not identify in itself. Because one tends to reject or remain ignorant of the least desirable aspects of one's personalities, the shadow is largely negative. Throughout the song, he digs through that shadow his subconscious in order to understand who he is, to love and accept himself fully and unconditionally. He mentions clearing out what could have been in order to evolve, implying that these insecurities and this self-hatred he feels and the rest of society feels is what prevents us from evolving as people. The song is all about the evolution of mankind through the acceptance of the subconscious self, the self that you despise. An incredible song. Track 6, Message to Harry Manback. Another interlude, I suppose. This one is an entire voicemail left on a friend of the band's answering machine. The message itself is an angry Italian man pretty much just berating this guy. The man ended up identifying himself 20 years later, named Francisco Sonoyo, and even wrote a book about the whole experience. How he wrote an entire book about something so incredibly stupid is impressive, but good for him. The name Harry Manback comes from a Bill Hicks stand-up routine. Bill Hicks is an incredibly important part of this album, so we're going to touch back on him later. Remember that name. 
Track seven, Hooker with a Penis. I believe the shortest track in Tool's discography. Another relatively silly song, nothing like what we've heard so far. It's a song the band created to shut up the fans that claimed they sold out. The band doubles down and agrees. They did sell out, and that's why you're hearing this album. At its core, all of music is intended to sell you the record, and Tool specifically does it fairly well. Not too much here. Next track, track eight, Intermission. Actually nothing happening here. Purely a setup for the next track, Jimmy. It does, however, consist of the melody of Jimmy played on an organ. Cool track, but on to the next. Track nine, Jimmy. Jimmy is the first song in Tool's discography to blatantly tackle the tragic life of Maynard's mother, Judith Marie. If you're unfamiliar with her story, in a nutshell, she had a cerebral hemorrhage, meaning a brain bleed, leaving her paralyzed for the remainder of her life, which was about 27 years, or 10,000 days. The title is in reference to Maynard's own name, Maynard James, or Jimmy, Keenan. The song begins with Maynard questioning his mother. What was it like to see? The face of your own stability suddenly look away, leaving you with the dead and hopeless. Absolutely beautiful line that I don't think I have to explain. The number 11 is brought up frequently on this track, as 11 was the age Maynard was when his mother first became paralyzed. 11 was also the last full year he spent with his mother before he moved in with his father at age 12. He views this 11-year-old self as a version of himself kind of frozen in time. He never really got through that year in his own mind. There's still a part of him stuck in the past with his trauma, a version he refers to as Jimmy. By coming home, he returns to his past, able to free the metaphorical Jimmy from his trauma. He views this time as the start of his own downward spiral. He was too scared to realize that the voice calling himself back home was the voice of himself. It was little Jimmy waiting for his mother to recover. By the end of the song, he's finally able to face that younger self and accepts his past. As the song concludes, he suggests Jimmy hold on to the light. Remember the good times with your mother. There was always a gap between these two people. All you can do is work to close that gap within yourself, to accept your trauma and your hardships with open arms. Incredible track, and kind of a precursor to the entire 10,000 Days album. Here's a shameless plug of my 10,000 Days analysis. Next track. Track 10, Die Eier von Satan. Easily the strangest song in Tool's discography. Die Eier von Satan is a song entirely in German depicting what sounds like an enraged speech, but is actually a weed cookie recipe. Just a silly track, and a much needed one after Jimmy. On to the next one, track 11, Push It. My favorite song on the album, and to be honest, it's not all that close. If you haven't heard the saliva version of this song, give that a glance, man. Absolutely mesmerizing performance. Anyway, the song tackles the concept of toxic relationships, but a one-sided one. The song begins with the character addressing his lover acknowledging the gap between them. Take care not to make me enter. If I do, we both may disappear. Incredible line. The first verse begins with the narrator likening himself to a mere infant. He finds his hopes and his dreams of, of fixing this relationship completely infantile and naive. And yet in this disgust for the infant within himself, he acknowledges that it was he who created this part of himself. The chorus begins as the narrator recites words of abuse, but I liken it to emotional abuse rather than physical abuse. You still love me, but you didn't need to push it on me. The narrator has fully accepted the toxic nature of the relationship and is, is ready to move on, but his partner won't let him. She begs him to stay. Stuck in a relationship he knows is destroying him. He finds himself falling back into her arms. He finds himself needing her. He feeds off her lust and he needs it to survive. He's alive when she touches him, alive when she's shoving him down. And yet he still knows deep in his heart that this can't last. The bridge begins and the song changes a bit. It's already an incredibly dark subject matter, but the song begins to sound a bit softer. It feels like the narrator has reached his breaking point here. It kind of mentally breaks. He's not where he wants to be. The gap between them widens and the song reaches its climax. I'm just going to read this next line to you. Really kind of feel what he's saying here. And if when I say I might fade like a sigh, if I stay, you minimize my movement anyway, I must persuade you another way. The gap is won, and he escaped. 
He faced the relationship head on, and he walked right out of the door. That's what I'd like to tell you. The narrator's efforts were, in fact, fruitless. There's no love and fear. He was completely broken. The woman he once knew was gone. He's now facing a manipulative and abusive devil. He reaches his breaking point. Seeing no other method of escape, he takes it one step too far. Remember, I'll always love you as I claw your fucking throat away. It will end no other way. He kills the woman he once loved, viewing it as his only method of escape. One of my favorite songs ever written. Track 12, Cesaro Some Ability. Another interlude and a much needed one after Push It. A little break, but to be honest, a terrible one. This track houses the sound of a crying baby for about a minute and a half. As for the meaning of the song, I read a super interesting document that I think provides a pretty cool meaning to the song. I'll link it in the description if you'd like to read the rest of it, it covers a lot of the tracks. Cesaro's so ability describes whether the numbers in an infinite series all converge to a single value when the series is drawn to infinity, or whether they do not converge. Now, I imagine you're not all mathematicians, so here's a little example for you. Take the series of numbers on screen here. As you carry this function on infinitely, the y value will approach but never quite reach the final value of zero. Although the function could never actually reach zero, the summability of the function would still be zero because it would continue getting infinitely close to that value until the number was pretty much zero. The opposite of this is divergent summability, which is showcased with this series of numbers here. If you were to add this series infinitely, it would never converge at a value and would therefore be unquantifiable. So what does this have to do with the baby crying in the track? Well, the series Maynard wants to discuss here is humankind itself and whether or not it converges or diverges. The birth of a baby is the birth of a new value in the series. The question he wants us to think on is whether or not mankind as a whole converges in a real value or diverges into infinite oblivion. In other words, is life meaningful or is it meaningless? And based on your answer, is there a meaning in the bringing of a new life into this world? Bet you didn't expect that for a minute and a half long interlude track of a baby crying, but that's tool for you. Track 13, Enema. As I said what feels like hours ago now, the title of the album and of this track is a play on the words anima and anima, the soul and ass surgery. To dive a little deeper into the procedure itself, it's a cleaning of some sort. Metaphorically and on this track, it serves as an analogy for the cleansing of mankind and the dislike Maynard blatantly feels for today's society. The song's lyricism isn't too overly complex here. It's just Maynard kind of talking about all the things he hates about today's society. His suggestion and his wish is for a flood. A flood big enough to wipe out Los Angeles as a whole. But it almost doesn't even feel like a wish. It feels kind of like a premonition. He believes that mom, in this case Mother Nature, will come and fix everything with a huge catastrophe. He suggests learning to swim, as it will be the only way of escape. A hard reset on our society by wiping out Los Angeles. The song continues on with one last prayer for Maynard. A prayer for mayhem. He wants to watch it all unfold. All of these phonies trying to survive their own destined fate. The song concludes with one last repetition of his wish. But don't just call him a pessimist and discredit his thoughts. Try and read between the lines. It's a song with heavy inspiration from the great Bill Hicks, a comedian I mentioned at some point earlier. He too had a grudge with Los Angeles, and he made it very clear throughout his shows. We'll touch on him one more time with the final track, so stay tuned. Incredible song. Track 14, Negative Ions. Negative Ions is the final interlude and the penultimate track on the album, serving to set up the next track, Third Eye. Not much really happens in this song. The noise heard is a buzzing sound coming from a device called a Jacob's Ladder. The title of the track refers to negative ions, which are known for causing a feeling of freshness and well-being. Negative ions are found in the air most commonly before storms and near waterfalls, perhaps meant to relax the listener before the final track. Track 15, Third Eye. Man oh man, Third Eye is what Rosetta Stone should have been. It feels like the entire rest of this album was building up to this track here. The song begins with an introduction from the late and great Bill Hicks, who goes on to discuss the villainization of drugs. He, and subsequently the band, believe that drugs have done some good things for us. 
They view it as a crucial piece of imagination and artistry, and an essential piece of a lot of the music that we know and love. Bill then discusses the suppression of the good side of drugs. Some drugs, when done safely and correctly, allow people to really reflect upon themselves and make a change. They view the war on drugs as a war on personal freedom, a battle that mankind can't afford to lose because what's next? The song then begins to depict a spiritual experience the narrator is going through, likely via DMT. The narrator feels as though he's right on the edge, the cusp of a spiritual awakening, and uses DMT in order to aid his efforts and to pry open his third eye. It's never been confirmed that this was a true story for Maynard's life, but it sure feels like it. The song, to me, feels like Maynard facing his traumatic childhood, an event that was foreshadowed earlier in the album on Jimmy. That song told us that he faced his past self, and this song feels like a retelling of that battle. It's a song that makes very little sense if you've never taken psychedelics, but if you have, man, this song is magical. The first verse begins as he describes a blue creature he sees in his dreams. Many people that have taken DMT report that they see a, a, a blue creature, and that this blue creature is connected to the universe in some way. The second verse discusses the narrator's concept of the third eye. He sees it as a piece of humankind that has been lost to the past. Something we all have, we just don't know how to use. The next verse discusses the very nature of life that the narrator can now see. Through the use of a psychedelic, he's able to understand that life is, is just a dream. Life's what we make of it. The chorus starts as the narrator's voice becomes a bit more desperate. So good to see you, he says. So glad it's over. This is directed at that blue character we talked about. The blue entity seems maybe not kind, but, but pure. The entity flees from him. It's not yet his time to meet it. The final verse begins as the narrator reaches what seems like the climax of his trip. He reaches into his subconscious, his shadow, and he pulls himself out of it. But something's wrong. He's completely broken, shattered into pieces. He tries to put himself back together in an attempt to see who he could have been, but what he created was unrecognizable. It's his past that made him. This being he created wasn't him, but, but the eye seemed so familiar. The narrator pries open his third eye, and I think that was his problem. Third eye isn't something that can be pried open. If it's real, it's attained through meditation and focus over time, not through force. He's so desperate to evolve and to let go of this past self that he attempts to rip open his, his own subconscious, his own soul, to pry open his third eye. With his third eye now pried open, the entity once again returns to him. He lets go of himself in this moment. His eye was finally open. With his letting go of his past and everything he once knew. The song concludes with the repetition of the phrase, prying open my third eye. Perhaps it closed immediately after the psychedelic wore off. Perhaps it never opened in the first place, but the narrator remains desperate to enlighten himself, to freeing himself from his past. Ridiculously good song and a perfect conclusion to the album. And with that, we have reached the end of the video. Thank you very much for watching. Subscribe for more. Peace.